Hello, adventurers. My name's Tyler. And I'm Richard. On today's episode, we'll be discussing Steamforge games' epic encounters and incorporating them into your home games. Welcome to True Strike. Welcome back to the show, everyone. As Tyler said, today we're talking about Epic Encounters. I'm sure you've all seen these in your uh, friendly local game store before. Uh, I've seen them a couple of times, actually. And I uh, didn't really know when I first saw them exactly what they were. And in fact, the first time that I ever saw them, I didn't even know that they were Dungeons & Dragons related content. I thought they were like a board game or something because of where they were in the store. And it wasn't until you actually told me what they were that I actually picked one up and looked at it and realized that uh, it was a drop-in kind of a thing for Dungeons & Dragons. Yeah. It's if you haven't seen them in the store, you now you know know to look for it. it they're kind of like black and whitish art style on the box with like a nice like reddish like font on the front, like Epic Encounters and anything made by Steamforge Games is always great and always has very high quality miniatures, which is one of my favorite parts of these uh, boxes. Yeah, Steamforge Games. Uh, my first introduction to them was actually through God Tier, the board game which has some really, really cool miniatures. And it was one of the first things that drew me to that board game was how awesome these miniatures were, the details on them. And then when I actually bought some of it, looking at them and the quality, um, you know, was high, but also the materials were really high. So the plastic was really, really nice, uh, even leaving them in my car over <laughs> uh, like the course of a month, uh, took them out and they were still in perfect condition. Which uh, is wild considering really, really cool. the price point for these is actually very low. Yeah, they it especially compared to anything else yes. that has a lot of miniatures in it. And if you're somebody who's coming from like war games, miniature prices is like a serious sticker shock situation for me. Every time <laughs> I see a high quality miniature, I automatically assume it's like GW level pricing, which is, you know, like one little dude who is four inches tall is gonna cost me like a hundred and thirty seven dollars. And you're gonna put them together yourself and <laughs> Yeah. But yeah, no, that was my first introduction to Steam Forge games. And then I was very uh, pleased to see that Epic Encounters is no different. The price point uh, is very attainable and oh, yeah. the amount of miniatures that you get in these sets is pretty astounding. Yes. Uh now speaking of you know amount of miniatures per set, basically the way they do it is each set you know there's there's two boxes there's always uh basically like a stage one which is minions and smaller enemies stuff like that that you buy and that is many many miniatures <laughs> you get a whole variety of different enemy types always leading up to like some sort of like boss battle and the quality is amazing from beginning to end and then ends in a, a part two like a stage two box set that is themed to go along with the first one or to run separately, depending how you want to drop it in or not. But if you're running all of this as one big one shot, you're going to pick up both boxes and the second one will always end in an epic encounter, a big boss battle to end off the night. Yeah. And the, from what I can tell when looking at all the sets, obviously we don't have them all. Uh, you own two of them now and we've only actively played one. But like you said, there's the, there's kind of a theme that's shared between the two sets, but the boss isn't exactly the same, like 100% as the minions. Right. Right. So it is just different enough to where you could totally use that boss battle as something standalone. Um, especially the one that we played, mm -hmm. I could definitely see that boss battle being used in a completely separate scenario and using that miniature and even the encounter area completely divorced from the first section of the game so while they are very similar in themes they're not a hundred percent identical which means that you can totally use them separately which i think is a really cool way to approach this because mm -hmm. that means you don't have to buy both sets to use either one you yeah. can buy one you can buy the other you can buy them both exactly especially the boss you know the, the the stage two the boss uh monsters and characters wow they are impressive no matter how large or small they are it it seems like the smaller ones have even more intricate detail and maybe come with a couple minions and stuff to help balance that out and then the large ones are just these behemoth creatures you can get for a relatively affordable price point we're talking like sub 50 dollars and 
you get an unpainted miniature, of course, but as our uh, colleague from work pointed out, um, you can do some amazing art on these guys. It turned out great what he did with it. Yeah, and actually, uh, I have a, a couple of pictures of that night that we could throw up on Instagram, especially one close up of the model, so you can actually Ooh. see that what was posted or what was painted by uh, our work colleague. Uh, he actually did a excellent job on this thing. Uh, so much fine detail on it, and uh, that's not like I said, not just the bosses. Even like you said, the minions also have a lot of really fine detail. And the variety of minions and there's is a, insane. Yeah, a huge variety, and it would all look amazing painted up and it takes paint really well obviously uh, you know we got a piece you know here in the studio when we were playing the other day and it looked beautiful yeah and in fact maybe you remember maybe you don't from when we were first looking through some of the miniatures but there are actually a couple i didn't even use because of time constraints from the first set yeah that's right i didn't see a couple of them because i know i looked at a couple of the miniatures when we first got the set just because i was curious of what was in there mm-hmm. and i do remember some very uh specific ones now that you mention it that i didn't see in our playthrough yep and even then we still had four separate enemies so i believe it came with six seven different minions and such to use for that first you know stage yeah that's really cool yeah and then for the second stage if you hadn't have purchased anything from the first They come with uh, cardboard cutouts, like little tokens you can use as minions instead. But if you did buy the first stage, well, there you go. You've already got the minions fully rendered in three dimensional (laughs) that you can uh, just throw down on the map. Yep. Which, speaking of which, it came with maps. Yes, each one also comes with a double sided map. Now, the first set uh, for the one we played had two separate uh, maps that you would use for two separate encounters. Um, Yet again, time constraints, we only actually used one of them. So the second one, wink, 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 we could use later for something else. Now, the uh, boss map was the same location, but varied. So if you wanted to change up the scenario slightly, there was two versions of the same area that had some things that had changed and such. Like ours had a, a ship that had had damage and it had like run ashore whereas the second version of it it wasn't damaged it was still a fully functional vessel that was in the water and different little story elements like that and things you can play with yeah so it seems like it's really easy to grab one of these boxes and decide kind of what you want to do with it so the way they're set up you can use this as a standalone so you can come into it like we did uh, which we're going to be talking about shortly here as a a one-shot scenario so we came in and we played through a uh, you know a short one evening game where we went through the minions and you know a setup scenario and then eventually fought a boss and called it a day but because of the way this is designed you could buy either or of these elements and plug them directly into a long-term campaign so like for example ours was themed uh for um ships and aquatic nature the ocean yeah the ocean (laughs) so it'd be really easy for you to have say your characters that are on a ship and they're heading to another location or something like that you need something unique and fun to happen you need an encounter that's going to break up the monotony of you're just on a ship and you're going to go a couple ports down on the coast and you're going to get there and everything is going to be fine right now you have something where you can just take and plug in either both of these encounters or one of these encounters Mm -hmm. and have a completely unique story setup of stuff that actually happened while you were aboard this ship. Yeah. Speaking of which into that, uh, aspect, uh, so this, the reason we even put this together is one of Richard and I's uh, best friends in the whole world. Uh, he had never played Dungeons and Dragons before and he wanted to check it out. So we, you know, as a, collective got this together put it together for him and everything and you know you've got these two boxes it's a one shot we know we're running a one shot well richard just mentioned how you can kind of put these in you know worlds you can kind of put them in something just surface level but just enough to maybe tie it into something um i really like what critical role has going with exandria and wild mountain stuff like that so like all right we'll take this you know we've got some like oceany theme what if we were pirates from dark toe you know, in the Lucidian you know, Ocean, stuff like that. So we built it in that, little drips of story here and there. And now, if we ever do come back to these characters, well, either A, we get another one-shot, or B, 
now we run stories in that world. And ta-da! You've got a little, like, mini campaign maybe. Or, you know, maybe it's just a nice little one-shot that had a little background lore that wasn't just out of the box. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing is that you could just treat it like that, just like a one-shot. But now, like you say, we kind of have these characters. We survived, spoiler alert, um, and we finished the uh, the entire set. And But now we have, like, this cool little backstory that kind of brings these characters together. So yeah. now we can go from here to another epic encounter. Mm-hmm. Like, we could totally just pivot into... This could just be the epic encounter Yeah, characters. just the epic encounter group. So this is the group where we have epic encounters. So we yeah. just jump from one crazy <laughs> scenario to the next, and we just have to think of a little intro in the beginning to think, okay, well, last time we were pirates and doing this. Why are we in these mines again? Oh, because <laughs> <laughs> our ship has run aground again and now (laughs) we're going to go into these mines and we're gonna fight goblins i guess so yeah we could either do it like that or we could just use this as a uh a really fun kind of intro that really isn't like one of the starter campaigns um but just kind of a a way to introduce our characters and we had this cool little uh thing that we went through that brought us a little closer together and now we're ready for like that serious homebrew campaign or big module yeah exactly and i mean Oh, man, I would love to have the time to run another serious campaign right now because these characters were really fun. And I'm glad that, you know, we did not to say we didn't have like, you know, deaths, air quotes and, you know, people going unconscious and stuff like that during the game. We did. But, you know, Dungeons Dragons, they get brought back pretty quickly in some cases. Uh, The only one that's even a question mark, you know, at the end you know, started off the game dead in one way or another. So <laughs> yeah, it's just the same either way. Um, so if we come back to these characters, like Richard said, it could, it could just be these little one shots. And I think no matter how we look at it, it would be, it would be fun, especially if we have some players that maybe can't commit full time, but every once in a while it could be like, Hey, I'm free this weekend. Do you guys want to maybe run a game? And with something like Epic Encounters, that's very easy for us to put together very quickly. Yeah, so we and, just have to run to the store, grab one, if we ha- don't already have one just on hand, flip it open. It's like a 20-page book for, you know, per box. You kind of flip through it, get your stat blocks, take a look at the area, decide what you want to do and how you want to flesh it together story-wise, and you're good to go. Yeah, I guess that was my first question to you, is because I uh, didn't look at this other than the miniatures. So, right, I purchased the minion box and uh, gave it to you after I we opened it up together, and I just wanted to see what some of the miniatures were like, because, like I said, I was very curious with Steamforge already having some experience with theirs, wanted to see more. But I never really asked you, because we just did this, like, days ago, how much prep work was involved in this because it doesn't seem like you would have to do a ton of prep work but i think like most things you it's kind of you put in what you want right i would assume so you can put in as much or as little prep as you want but i guess the main question here is uh having just run one of these do you feel like you could have you know on short term like you're saying like you got somebody coming in from out of town you only have one day to put together a game for somebody is epic encounters something that you can put together in a day's time just by going out and buying it and getting something that quick up for your gaming group. And it's just going to be a one shot for the night. Yeah. Just a one shot for the night. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not an issue at all. I could run over to our friendly local gaming store, grab one off the shelf right now, read it on the way home. If you were driving me, you know, (laughs) and honestly be good to go when I got here. Yeah. Because in, and I say that as someone who runs games, so I was able to read through this thoroughly once and then have the book on me to reference. Now, the the book that, you know, the, the information they give you has as much or as little added information as you want it to. There are environmental uh, hazards. There are extra enemies. There are timed events that will happen. Or you could just lay the map down and run it as a battle and lay some minis and be like, all right, here we go. But if you want to make it to where... When your players run across a a rickety bridge, they roll a d6 to see if if something happens to them. (laughs) The book's ready for you to do that, and it has consequences and stuff like that. So if you feel free to flip through the book really quick and get to that page, and that's one thing is I wish you could reference more of that on the same page or two so that the information was closer together because I definitely had to flip between like six different pages at different times to get to things and then the stats for enemies are at the back so you're just kind of going back and forth now if you have even more time to prep or just are better at prepping than me 
and don't fly as willy nilly as I do, you could write a lot of this down. But you're buying this, wanting to run it out of the box. I've got a nice colored booklet out of the box. I want to use the booklet. Yeah, use the booklet out of the box, <laughs> which I was fully able to do. I'm I complaining didn't because up I'm picking it apart. <laughs> yeah, I didn't pick up on that at all. That you were frantically flipping through pages, and and maybe it's because I was, you know more more or less looking at the battlefield and the map and the miniatures which is and what great. we were doing yeah and maybe like i said i have been running these games a little bit for a little bit now so that's easier for me to do because i can kind of fill in the gap with story notes as i'm as my mouth is talking my eyes and hands can be flipping through the next page <laughs> whereas maybe a n- brand new dungeon master if this is going to be your first uh, game you run it would actually be really good for that. It, it does help you it, a lot. It doesn't give you real story beats. Like you, It's not going to give you a story. You're going to have to make a story to go with this. But what it does give you is some character interactions and environmental storytelling. So you read through this front to back, learn exactly what it says, fill in your own narrative, and then... Write down anything and everything you need to and reference everything else on the fly and you should be good to go. There's no reason someone couldn't run this as their first game. And in fact, it's very good for scaling depending on how new your players are. There was a version and it tells you how to how to handle damage in DC, like saving throw DCs and stuff like that of levels like one to four. And then it's like five to seven and then like 12 to 13 or something like that. And there's these different different groups of, of okay, your players can be this, and it makes the enemies this hard. And because of that, boom, now you can drop it right into whatever game you are playing at the table right now. Even if this isn't just a one shot. Yeah, and I think that's uh, also another thing that I thought about. Which, and it kind of, you know, I thought about it as I was deciding what character I was going to play for this too. It was an, an interesting way for me to introduce and play a character that I probably wouldn't normally play to. Mm, yeah. Because this uh, was a situation where I, you know, it was very low pressure. Mm-hmm. Right, because they were like, "Oh, oh we're gonna, sure. we're doing a one shot." You know, maybe we'll use these characters down the line, but we're gonna be playing a game where we're gonna try and get somebody that we know uh, to see what it is that we do. Right, because uh, the person that we're talking about, our very best friend, had uh, never played Dungeons and Dragons. His exposure to Dungeons and Dragons was us talking about it and listening to our podcast. So yeah. he doesn't really know what to expect, didn't really know what to expect, you know, wasn't sure what it is that we actually do. Yeah. So for him, this was, uh, you know, a very new experience and we knew all that going in too. So like I said, it was kind of a way for me to like, you know, kind of just try out something new that I have never played and hadn't really considered for a long-term campaign, Yeah. Um, which ended up uh, being a little bit broken, I think. No, not at all. <laughs> I Honestly, I don't think so. I think... In a in a one shot encounter, right? You are very powerful. But to be fair, fighters are very powerful. <laughs> yeah, they can be. And a lot of your biggest power plays came from things like Action Surge and Second Wind. Yeah, that's true. The other abilities being strong were just strong, but they were burst damage. Yeah. You could do it once. You could do it twice if you're, you know, DM said, good job, you do it again. <laughs> and maybe maybe that's the whole point of an epic encounter was like making you feel epic. Yeah. And it, uh, it did a good job at that, making my character feel crazy and powerful and having these cool moments that I was able to pull off and everything like that. Um, but yeah, you know, like I said, more to the point, I think that this is a good utility for trying out characters. And then you might try out a character that you find out that you like in this kind of a scenario that you end up porting over to other adventures or maybe the entire party keeps moving on like what I see with happening with us here. Which, to be fair, I, I think that is just the nature of one shots in general. This is the best time to make a wacky character or something you wouldn't normally play and you want to dip your toes in. But... With epic encounters, it's never been easier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just super easy. You go out and buy a box or two. You sit down. You play a game. And you just have fun. Yeah. And especially one like this. For the same reason 
So that one of the Epic Encounter sets, you know, the Stage 1, Stage 2, that I already own that we have yet to play, uh, features Undead. It's like an Undead arena with lots of, like, lots of skeleton boys and stuff like that. And it ends in a boss battle against the Lich. I've really wanted to play this. We just haven't been uh, have found the chance to do it. But with our best friend, um, hmm, for a conversation's sake, we'll call him Jimmy. So with Jimmy never having played this game before, we wanted to get something that would maybe pique his interest. And we know he likes things like reptiles and turtles and things like this. So we're like, oh, they've got a dragon turtle box. This isn't even us looking at, you know, what's in the stage one. We're like, let's get the dragon turtle yeah, set. The dragon turtle was the selling point. Yes. And it just so happens that all of the archons, the really cool, like, crab folk that are in the first set, just happen to be really cool miniatures. <laughs> and so it was a win win across the board. Yeah. So the two sets that uh, we picked up for this is Epic Encounters Island of the Crab Archon and Epic Encounters Cave of the Dragon Turtle. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, if you haven't already picked up on that, the Island of the Crab Archon is uh, basically just that. It's a bunch of crab people. There is a race of aquatic uh, people. They're mostly crabs. So like one of the first things that we ran into was a little tiny hermit crab <laughs> that was uh, super adorable and also quite deadly with its big old claw. Yep. And then we got to see all manner of other aquatic aquatic types of people we had like this horseshoe crab looking guy with a net and a trident there was a um uh this one i guess the leader woman who had an eel wrapped around her yes and that's another thing so she has this very large eel that is floating around her like mysteriously and it actually imposes disadvantage on any kind of incoming attack because the eel is mechanically attempting to defend her yeah, which was fun. It was it was super cool. She had two guards. Mm -hmm. um, immediately underestimated how powerful she was, um, <laughs> because like on her very first you, turn, you say that, but she you went immediately for her. Well, yeah, because she was scary looking. So yeah, you put a big target like that on the board. I'm gonna try and take it down. And mm -hmm. then she immediately retaliated, and it uh, it hurt quite bad. Um, but yeah, it uh, it was really cool though, seeing those miniatures. And then of course the aforementioned dragon turtle as the uh, the titular boss was an awesome miniature, huge, massive dragon turtle. Yeah. Uh, and like I said, um, very very cool when it was all painted up and everything like that. But yeah, Jimmy um, does like reptiles a lot. So when this set was the one that we decided on, uh, you know, it was probably like the best option, I think, for us for this one shot. Now, there's a lot of other cool ones. It would have been fun to do the Dragon Lich one. Um, there's also one of my favorite ones that I do plan on picking up and wanting to play is the Goblin Mine one because that one also has like a giant tunneling worm as a boss, which is so cool. And that's and, that's another one where like you get the set and then lucky you you now are the proud owner of a bunch of really cool goblin miniatures yeah and, which you will never not need for any campaign you ever run unless you're playing I don't know, anti goblin land or yeah. something something but otherwise yeah you need goblins yeah, you can use goblins anywhere yeah now one thing is what about how long this this we played for what four or five hours at least ooh. Yeah, I, I want to say it was about four hours. Okay, and that was us not even touching all the content. Yeah, the, and yeah, you said we skipped over quite a bit of content. Yes. So we only used one side mm -hmm. of the map. We only used four out of the six enemy types uh, yeah. in the minion box. I think if we had played to completion, not accounting for any extra story bits that we may have just... Because that's where a lot of the time comes from, is us just, you know, shooting the combo back and forth, you know, as our characters. But you know, at least another hour of combat alone. But yeah. now that's another set of miniatures and another combat we can roll later with uh, actually, you know, hinting and pulling things back from this. It's like, oh, well, who are these people? Why are these crab people back? Who's that guy? Why does he seem upset that we killed his wife? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wait a minute. <laughs> keep, keep using it. Keep rolling it. So I, I'm... You know, even outside of this game, I'm excited to use these miniatures just for aquatic, com you know, combats going forward. But yeah, if we do, maybe if Jimmy actually enjoyed the game, maybe he would come back and we don't even have to buy another box out. You know, we could sit down for a couple hours and 
continue, you know, the story of these characters. We had a uh, guff, the gif. We had new tracks, the Skella boy, uh, kobold. And then we had Darius, the Allen and together them three with, uh, captain, uh, Jim hops. They were smuggling some stuff. <laughs> <laughs> We can't talk about it on a puck. No, uh, they were smuggling some residuum. <laughs> and, you know, that was the big, big point of thing, blah, 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 you know, whatever. But you very, very easily, yeah, now we tie back into this new combat or or story balance or whatever just because we've got minis left over. <laughs> yeah, and it made for a, uh, a really fun entry one-shot. And we decided to do a lot more role-playing in ours. Right, because that's what we do. We that's, we're role players. Yeah, we're. If you guys haven't picked that up yet, I know everyone's table is different, and I, I, you do not have to play like us. A hundred percent, find the table that jives with your jiviness, <laughs> and if you, you know, if you want a hundred percent combat, that's fine. Find those tables. If you want more combat than role play, totally good. Find those tables. We're probably like a. 75 25 split i'd say of story to combat and that even in this epic encounter where combat is basically what it gives you and everything else you give it is your role-playing i think we still probably leaned heavier on role-playing than combat yeah and that's that's the thing these epic encounters are really set up i mean it's right there in the name epic encounter yes right so what you're buying in this is an encounter. You're buying two encounters, or actually not really two encounters, but two encounter themes, one with minions, one with a boss. So it's very leaning into that. You are buying into a battle. So you're buying into a fight. This is going to be a battle. But you don't have to be just a battle, right? So we decided to do a lot of role play in ours, which made it a four hour game where we didn't see all the battle <laughs> combat. Right. We could have leaned even heavier into the battle, made this an even longer thing and done everything involved. Mm-hmm. Or if you're the kind of table that just wants to fight, then real easily done with this. <laughs> I oh, mean, it's, if, if you were just it's a map with miniatures, you just need some miniatures of your own. If you're just a battle heavy group, y- you could just open this up, start putting monies on the table and then flip straight to the stat blocks. Yeah. This is like heaven. And even then like they're great stat blocks. You're good to go pump up your player levels, pump up the bad guy levels and just start rolling dice. Yeah. But if you are the type that want the story, this is not a module. It does not give you a story point A to point B. It gives you some themes on who the enemy is and maybe some reason of why they're doing what they're doing. And that's a literally loosely. It's super loose. And that's where I recommended the whole read through, know everything it does give you and then flow your own story through it. Yeah. Because if you're running a, you know, that kind of game you have to you have to put yeah, in you're gonna work. have to inject something into it but if you just want battle just open the box yeah but for us we we were airing a little bit more on the side of role playing so what tyler had presented us with was you know a way to get us all on the same ship and get us all to a an island kind of situation where we were at which was super great. I think it was a really great way to introduce a bunch of new characters rather than just being around in a tavern meeting. Uh, we were essentially all hired to join the same crew and we were, you know, going from port out to a place that was called the den. So yes. we could uh, buy the, or no, actually not buy, but sell the residual and then take it back to port. And, uh, our group, uh, as you mentioned before, uh, was pretty unique. So uh, our Jimmy, as his first foray into Dungeons and Dragons, chose a druid. Yes, an Owlin druid. An Owlin druid. So he was our our main caster, and then uh, outside of that, we had uh, a bard, which was the the skeleton boy kobold, which uh, was a character that was actually a throwback to a previous campaign. So he wasn't always a skelly boy. He he was alive <laughs> at one point, um, which I thought was really fun deep lore for the other two people at the table. Of course, Jimmy having you know no idea about these past characters. <laughs> the the extra little tidbit there is that the 
the character New Tracks originally, you know, Kobold Artificer, had passed away on our second session of a Critical Role campaign we were playing. I was a player in this game, Richard was a player in this game. We all lost our characters in an underwater battle very early on, and that's where the game ended. Nothing else came of it. Yeah, it was just It's a been at least game. a year. <laughs> yeah. So, lo and behold, we have a game set in the same setting, and, you know, our work colleague is like, yeah, what if this character is just a skeleton now and washed up on shore? And we're like, bet. <laughs> yeah. He's like, what if I'm also multi-classed into Bard? And I'm like, even better. Even better. Go for it. Yeah. So that one, like I said, was really cool, fun, deep lore. If, oh, even yeah. if it was only for the two of us, even just, if Jimmy had no clue what was going on there. Just other than drinking away in the ocean. The, crazy. The rum dead pouring cold. right through his body. Yeah. <laughs> well, bones. <laughs> And then I got to actually play a character that I had originally uh, set aside for doing a a Spelljammer campaign that also never happened. Um, which, no, so I have a couple Spelljammer characters, right? And this one happened to be one that I didn't think I was going to get to play. And that's because uh, the GIF, Guff... <laughs> was actually a gunslinger so we're talking unofficial materials here and uh, i wasn't sure that i was actually ever really going to get to play a gunslinger but critical role yes but critical role um so yeah that's how i got to chat uh test him out and like i said that was the one that i felt maybe was a little bit overpowered uh just because gunslingers man who but you're just saying that from and, and to be fair you are saying that from player point of view as dm and the one with the multitude of enemies on my side of the screen and stat blocks and stuff like that i don't think so i don't know you you, you seemed a little shocked when i first used the grip point <laughs> And then shot your the the very first opening shot of this game, which was he dropped out a couple minions on the board with one that was the obvious leader. And my first thought was, um, I think I'm going to I think I'm going to shoot her. And then I even said, I'm going to do something stupid Mm -hmm. and it's either going to like really pay off Mm -hmm. or it's going to be horrible. And I took a gamble. And decided to take a shot at her, Mm -hmm. which was at disadvantage. Correct. And I managed to still hit her, even at disadvantage, using a grip point, which gave me extra die. And then I rolled near max damage on both those dice. So my very first move in the game was to make an incredibly violent gunshot Mm -hmm. from 50 feet away from the boss of that specific encounter. And deal a significant amount of damage. And why I don't think that was is a broken move is because the the gamble on that was so high yeah. it was a disadvantage and the chance of your gun just exploding in your hand basically was what a, a rolling a one to five yeah right? true yeah so you had a 25 percent chance on two dice rolls so i won't even get into the statistics there <laughs> but each roll had a 25 percent chance of being a jam or a failure and neither were yeah. So you did a lot of damage. So I did a lot of damage, yeah. But if they had been, you would have done no damage <laughs> and had a uh, misfire. It would have gone much worse for everyone yes. involved. Yes. And you would have used up your grip point, yeah. which you don't get back easily. Yeah. And that's that's where I'm saying, like, you've got this really good burst damage. You know, people always talk about paladins of burst damage, but their burst damage is safe. I hit, then I say, let me throw a smite on there. Oh, and natural 20, make it a level two smite, you know? <laughs> You're saying I want to use a grip point to make my chance at failure higher at the chance that if I do hit, it's extra damage. But even then, it's a dice roll for the damage. Yeah. You could roll low on that one. All right. I get you. I get so, you. and you can only do that how many times? Oh, like I only had one grip right. point. Yeah. Once. So, yep. And you can get back on natural 20, stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, you get back. Or you said there was even a role where the DM could Interestingly like, enough, yeah. If that was you, pretty cool. If you kill a, uh, an, an enemy that the DM, I guess, deems worthy of being an epic kill, they can, you know, so graciously give you your grit point back, which I thought was kind of funny. Yeah, no, stuff like that's neat. I but like yeah. that it's built into the rules that the DM can just give you a wink and a nod and say, yeah, this is where we found out that uh, the stat block uh, for these epic encounters, they ain't playing um, because she clapped back at us and who man, that one hurt. I think she took our druid down to a whole whopping two hit points from full, 
from her attack back at us and me only taking half damage dropped me half my total hit points. <laughs> so yeah, that was uh that was pretty funny. But yeah, so that was uh, our character composition and we didn't really jump straight into the battle, right? So yeah. like I said, we jumped into role play mode. So Absolutely. we spent the first part of this game, I would probably say for the first hour of this game easily before we even saw a miniature other than our own. Right, we did go to the map and we did use the map. You utilized that with us just moving around and, like you uh, mentioned before, with the rickety boards, which was really funny. Um, trying to walk gangplanks and stuff like that. Uh, and so the we dolphin. did use. We ended up using the maps and we ended up using those as a role play aid for us to get into the scenario that we were in. And we played for probably over an hour before yeah. you introduced the first miniature and the first epic encounter. My favorite part of the entire session was like beginning to end was the dolphin that kept harassing your character. Yeah. I have a <laughs> deep mistrust in dolphins now. <laughs> <laughs> it just seemed very suspicious to me. It had been fine. Yeah. What's I still don't trust happened? that dolphin. Yeah, I still don't <laughs> trust it. Every time the dolphin showed up, something bad happened. Every single time. <laughs> Coincidence. Yeah, I don't know I if that's in the you. book. I'm not sure because I couldn't <laughs> see past the DM screen. But if you do get Island of the Crab Archon and you're running this epic encounter, and just beware if you see a dolphin. Uh, <laughs> just, just be wary. <laughs> But yeah, it took us over about an hour uh, before we actually, you know, like I said, hit the first actual encounter, which uh, I guess you said we used four of the probably available six or so types mm -hmm. of miniatures. And then uh, that battle, I'm trying to remember how many we actually fought. I think it was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven individual enemies. Was that including the first? Including okay. the first one, yeah, in that round of fighting, essentially. Which I'm not even sure how long that battle lasted. Um, I know we played for about four hours. We role played for an hour. That battle probably 30, 40 minutes. I don't know. I was just gonna say an hour. Really? Yeah. I mean, it, it all flies. It all. Yeah. It I was all gonna say that amalgamates into one. Yeah. I was gonna say that was probably an hour's worth of combat there, and then we had another uh, bit of time where we were more role playing, more jumping back and forth. Um, before we entered another combat, which probably took about another hour or so. And shout out to Jimmy, as we'll call him. He actually picked up everything pretty quickly. He, you know, of course, had questions as we went, which you fully expect trying to teach 5th edition to anybody. Yeah. But I was always able to make a decision quickly and, you know, was, you know, was very quick to grasp, like, what was the best thing to do in a situation. So... It's fairly good for a first try. Yeah, and I think that bodes well for Epic Encounters and first-time D&D players. And I think one of the main uh, draws of this uh, versus, like, say, one of the starter sets, like Stormwreck Isle. And not to say that, mm. like, Minds of Fandalver and Stormwreck Isle and stuff like that are bad products, because they're not. They're no. really great products, and they're really good price points. I feel like they're geared towards players for different reasons. Yes, and that's what I was going to say, is that um, I think that they are definitely different types of games. Like, this is, like you said before, not a, a module, so to speak. This is an encounter is what it yeah. is. But I think it did lend itself really well to a first-time player, because you can insert just as much role playing as you want to, right? So you can make it heavy on role play like we did. Mm -hmm. If you didn't want to, you can make it light on role play. Right. It's got a gridded map, right? So right off the jump, you have visual aid, right? So it's really easy for a new player to come in and not have to play theater of the mind with, uh, you know, like how far am I away from everything? Wait, he's 10 feet away. I'm five feet away. What happens if I move three feet, right? So it's it's a little bit different with theater of the mind and a new player. Sometimes wrapping your head around combat can be a little bit more challenging. So right off the jump with something like Epic Encounters, you've got this gridded map, right? And then you have miniatures, which is huge, for, especially for new players. When you get to see things, um, there's a lot of people that are very visual when it comes to learning. And I think this helps out a ton. So I think that something like this is really good for a new player because like I said, Jimmy was very easy to sit down, look at this map, look at these miniatures and understand the flow of how things worked. And that was even outside of combat. So we were yep. using the maps, and the miniatures before combat even started. So even more so it, uh, it is more of a tool for you to 
make it easier, I think, for a new player to visualize stuff in their mind. They mm-hmm. can still visualize in their mind, but then they get to look down at a table and see, you know, like, oh, there's a big hut over here. There's a little hut over here. There's these wooden gangplanks everywhere. So when you're telling us how rickety it is or anything like that, it makes you think more about your surroundings and how you might approach them and what you may or may not do. That's a really good point, especially with that you pointed out that the maps are gridded because theater of the mind, you know that your spell has a range of 30 feet you're like all right well how far away is this person or how far do i need to move i'm like okay they're they're about 50 feet from you right now and you're like all right, i can move up 20 feet and you're you've experienced you know what all these things mean but if i point at a map and i say each square is five feet and you look at your movement and you've got 30 you're like okay cool so i can move six times in six squares and i say bingo boingo you got it and then how far does the spell shoot 30 feet okay i can move six squares and i can shoot my spell another six squares sweet i got it you can really just you could just play it like a board game in that stance like and i think that helps grasp the idea of it more than just brain storytelling it's brain with physical play yeah it's one less thing that you really have to worry yourself over trying to wrap your head around right because if you can say well now you can just focus on the storytelling elements of how you're going to move and what you're going to do and you don't have to worry so much about the math of the situation Mm -hmm. like positioning and everything like that because it's a lot easier for you to see that and visualize it so i do think that for uh somebody that is starting out brand new this is a really good option and it you know we saw that live here we saw somebody that's never played any form of Dungeons and Dragons and hasn't really played a lot of board games either was able to come in and pick it up relatively easily. Yeah, no issues. Yeah. Now, oh man, I, I really, I want to give a big, big overall thank you and shout out to Steamforged Games for creating these. I don't know if they're massive sellers or not, but either way, the, the fact that they keep releasing these and the quality is so good good and i mean the just the idea that you're getting a double-sided full color map with these very high detail mini like just you get a ton of of enemy creatures in in you know the stage one box in this beautifully detailed large creature for your second stage for like i said a very very reasonable price where i could go purchase a set of miniatures right now just random whatever from you know our local store and easily spend as much or more and get less for it and you get all of these and they're all themed together as well so these are these are miniatures we're going to use for some time not just for this one shot so thank you steam forge games yeah this uh is a pretty amazing product overall i have nothing negative to say about it honestly and if anything i'm just more excited now to play more of them so yes. like I said, I was already a little bit hyped for it. And then when I first saw these two specific sets that we ended up playing released, that one really piqued my interest mm-hmm. because I love water-based stuff and dragon turtles and crabs and everything like that. So I saw it and I was like, that's something fun. That's something I really want to try. But then having looked at all the other sets, I want to play them all now. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So like there's there's a lot of really cool stuff there. And uh, it does get me excited for some either one shots or revisiting some of these crazy characters again. Like yeah. uh, I, I, I did have fun with Guff the GIF, <laughs> even though he, you know, is a spell jammer character that you so graciously let me plop down on a planet crash yeah, with it. his ship broken tis and, but a one uh, shot why not <laughs> being a pirate yeah and that's the that's the cool thing is that it's a, like i said before it does allow you to play a character that you maybe is kind of a little bit out of place or that you uh don't know where you're going to use and uh, you get to kind of test them out and uh use them in a scenario that could be a lot of fun yeah i completely agree but yeah can't wait to play more of these epic encounters because uh they are quite epic all right well Till next time, I've been Tyler. And I've been Richard. And we've been True Strike. Hey, adventurers. Thanks again for joining us today. Please be sure to give us a follow on your favorite podcasting platforms and YouTube. If there's any questions you'd like to write into the show, you can hit us up on Twitter or Instagram. New episodes release every Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern. Thank you for listening. 
to TrueStrike.